Hello, we are going to start. Guys, Dino, thank you. We are going to start, so welcome to the LISP working group. Remember, this session is being recorded. Okay, the usual note well. You are supposed to already have uh, read this during the re registration process. Very short summaries, whatever you say today is a contribution to the IET Act, okay? With some delay. There is another note well this time, which is similar to what we had uh, last time in a different way. It's just we are here for technical reason, technical discussion, so respect uh, each one another, okay? Um, remember the blue sheets is, are now virtual, so if you are here, you should log in in the Mythico client using the uh, local client. Okay, if you are remote, you use the full-fledged uh, client so that you have a video and everything that you need. Usual uh, pointers, so um, to the charter, Zulip Room, Audio Stream, Mythico, you should be online already. And there is the link for the, the materials of this session, okay? Uh, Oh, I forgot to introduce myself, sorry. I'm Luigi, here is Padma, we are the co-chair. Over there is Alberto, secretary, who will help in taking the minutes to, uh, to be published after this uh, session. So I'm polite, <laughs> sorry. So uh, uh, a small um, update a little bit on the situation about the, the different uh, documents. Um, small progress this time. Uh, we. We have pops up that is in, almost done, really almost done. We are waiting for Albert to give a, a, a last message, so and then will be published. It's in the uh, out for uh, 48 um, period. It's not 48 hours. It's actually two weeks at least. But uh, anyway, we are very very close by. <laughs> okay, uh, we have the Lisp name encoding. Alberto was so kind to take over the, um, to be shepherd, so we'll do the work right after this, uh, this meeting. Um, the young model was close to, to uh, working group last call. The authors um, did ask for a last call on the mailing list uh, last week, basically. Uh, Matt sent uh, a few comments, so Albert will, Alberto, sorry, will take uh, a few minutes after uh, Dino's presentation in order to make a point on this document. Okay. And I think I'm through with the updates. As for the agenda, so we have uh, first Prakash uh, talking about uh, side external connectivity for Lisp. Okay. Um, then Dino. We'll talk about something. He changes title every time he sends slide out. We will see. <laughs> and as I said, Alberto will take uh, uh, five minutes on the young model. And then we will go on the rechartering. So we were working on the new charter. So we will share it with you. Padma will present the main points of this new proposed charter uh, that we will also share on the mailing list following the, the usual procedure. Okay. Any comment? No. Thanks. So uh, we can move to the fir first presentation. So, Prakash, 
I will share the slide, it's fine. Actually, you, you can control the slides. Hello. Can you guys hear me? No. Hello. That's better. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Prakash Jain from Cisco. Presenting here today, update on the Lisp external connect, uh, Lisp site external connectivity draft, which we presented first time in the ITF 115 London. I'm putting the update on, on that today. With me, my co-authors are Sanjay Huda, who is here today. Thanks, Sanjay. And uh, Victor Moreno, who will be probably joining remote no, not here in the conference room. So with that, what changed between the previous version and the, uh, and the next, uh, the current version? We addressed all the review comments, which was pr uh, provided during the meeting, as well as on the mailing list and all the discussion. Thanks, Padma and Dino. <laughs> and, uh, the main addition during all the update was the pub sub, which was not present earlier, and now we have added uh, into the draft. So what I'll be presenting today is the major update, what we did from the, uh, from the previous time we presented. As you know, the draft provides the, uh, the dynamic external connectivity of the, uh, of the lift site especially for the destination which are unknown, uh, not known to the site, as well as the, uh, the destination which are known but not registered yet to the, uh, to the mapping system. And the draft provides all the mechanism of the register, request, notify, uh, as well as the, uh, the map reply. What we added additionally was the subscribe, uh, subscribe mechanism and the publishing mechanism. Also, there was a, 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 there's an, uh, a section which we added to how to install or update the map caches with the PTR or with the proxy ETR. For the registration process and uh, I'll be mostly uh, telling now the update from the previous version, but if, if there's any question, please let me know. We, uh, we can handle, we have, I think, 15 minutes of the time to, uh, to give it to it. Registration mechanism, there is no change uh, as such. Whatever we presented last time, it's the same. The, uh, the request for the proxy ETR, request for the PTR, uh, where we added the uh, uh, the subscription mechanism as part of the map request the n bit will be set and uh, 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 based on that map server will update to all the requesting itr uh, using the uh, the publication mechanism and uh, as such there is no uh, all the mechanism of the uh, list legacy list messages and the, uh, the publication subscription, not major change. Or, uh, or, or we didn't change anything as part of this, this draft. The majority of the things are how to use the existing mechanism to provide this dynamic external connectivity mechanism. So once the N bit will be set in the, in, in, in the map, uh, map request, the, any changes on the uh, on the PETR or in the prox proxy ETR will be updated to all the uh, all the uh, uh, ITR who has subscribed for, for that uh, uh, automatically. 
and uh, yeah, uh, and for, for that map notify will be used as uh, as usual the uh, the pubsub uh, as per the pubsub uh, uh, draft uh, rest of the things are exactly same Uh, PTR uh, resolution also same, but this is now only applicable when there is no pop sub mechanism available. At that time, if there's a uh, the, there's a request, uh, uh, the the map reply procedure will be f followed as uh, we explained uh, last time. Now this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, section which we added. There was a, a question and the comment last time that. Will every uh, packet will go to now to, uh, to the proxy ETR? Uh, uh, and uh, the answer uh, 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 without generating the map request. And the answer is no, because uh, the way uh, the draft uh, uh, draft specify or draft to suggest the mechanism, the known all the known EID blocks or the known the EID re range should be uh, programmed at the ITR to generate the map request. So all the map caches, the whole map caches or the def uh, uh, default uh, map caches uh, uh, will be uh, less specific than those, uh, those more specific known EID range. So that way it will make sure that all the, uh, all the known EID will generate a mapping request but only when there's a whole entity installed in the map cache, or if it's not installed, then the ITR can decide to install the uh, the whole prefix as per the uh, known negative map reply process procedures, or the ITR can choose to put the, a default uh, uh, a map cache, like zero, zero, zero slash zero map cache with the PTR in it, based on the map notify or the map reply process uh, uh, specified in the draft. Uh, we last time we uh, we suggested this uh, uh, this use case for the default PTR, like uh, in, in the uh, uh, whenever the packet needs to go to a, a default uh, proxy ETR, this mechanism can be used where the default proxy ETR can be dynamically updated based on the different condition at the uh, uh, proxy ETR. So everything is same. A map request now. Uh, can also be uh, a subscribe request at the ITR so that when there's any any change in the default uh, uh, proxy ETR, that will automatically will be updated at the <coughs> ITR without any map request response uh, 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 steps in between. Uh, uh, and uh, similarly, when the uh, 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 instead of the uh, map reply, map notify can be used to publish for that PTR proxy ETR changes. So these, uh, so again, like major changes here are the uh, the pub, uh, pub sub mechanism. Rest everything is same as the we specified last time in the thing. So with that, I think these are the major update. I'm open to any questions or anything uh, uh, you might have. If something is not clear or anything we could not resolve on the mailing list and next step obviously we would like to have the working group adoption because it looks like last time we saw the enough interest and uh, yes so okay first thing is question or comments just Joel Halpern Erickson I just went and looked at the draft to try to figure one thing out you're using the Lisp distinguished name thing. One of the things I went to some trouble about in the Lisp distinguished name was to say, each usage has to say how their name is distinguished from the other use cases so that you don't end up with name collisions. I couldn't find anything in the draft on that. Have you addressed it yet or is that an open item? So what we specify in the draft that, that distinguished name could be uh, uh, agreed upon in in the in, in the fabric, or <laughs> if it is. <laughs> I think you'll need to write a little more. Sure. No, we, Dino has. This. Okay, this is Dino. So you could just say we're going 
to distinguish the distinguished name by the mechanism specified in the name encoding. And what that is, is you pre, rather than agree on the name, which can conflict with other use cases, you agree on the instance ID of the VPN, and then you, you just always look up and register default PTR in, the, um, in that VPN. Thank you. Some, yeah, we'll make a reference. We'll, yeah. we'll add that. Reference is already there, but we'll add yeah. the, the statement. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, what you said was uh, uh, yeah. make sure. a reference to the wise new. Sure. sure. Thanks. Thanks for Don't that. forget to push on the Mythico local client when you queue up. Yeah. Sorry. Don't, don't forget to push on the Mythico client when you queue up. That's the normal procedure oh, we should use. <laughs> just a reminder. Um, any other comments or question? No? In this case, since they are asking, the authors are asking for a working group adoption, I will send out a, a session so that you can raise your hand or, or not whether you want this document be adopted should we start now so use the mythical client in order to reply Don't be shy, it's anonymous. <laughs> okay, this is anyway a small group. I uh, would say that looks positive, let me for fairness, make the the converse call if anybody is against this adoption. Just a sec. Here again. So if you are against raise your hand is anonymous we will ask you for the reason on the mailing list <laughs> because it's the usual procedure this is the negative statement so yeah everybody should read it this is not the same one what <laughs> we did two minutes back ah i just noticed i put not in capital letters in my uh, when i wrote but then is everything is capital on the screen. Yeah. Okay. If somebody is quickly reading, he's thinking that it's the same thing. Yeah, uh, I didn't know this before. Oh, anyway, nothing is moving. So seems that the, there is a, a, a more consensus on, on adopting this document. We will take it to the mailing list anyway. This is the normal procedure, and we'll open a, a, a call for adoption on the mailing list. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, Dino, this is now up to you. Uh, we share the slides. Just, uh, yeah. You can control oh, something. Yeah. Yes. Test, test. Can you hear me? Uh, hi, I'm going to, on behalf of the other three uh, people that were um, involved in this testing effort, give you a demonstration of three technologies that we combined into one. So um, what we did is we wrote um, a multicast application called GapChat. And Gap is a group allocation, ad, group address allocation protocol we're working on in the PIM working group. And so we wanted this multicast application to work over the wide area network. And since we don't have multicast everywhere, we wanted to be able to make it work over the LISP overlay. 
and the links that we're using are residential links, satellite links, all behind that devices. So we wanted to show all that technology uh, working here. So what is GAP? Uh, we wanted to build a decentralized multicast group allocation protocol. So there's no central entity that allocates group addresses. It happens by all the participants that are running a multicast application. Um, the group addresses are allocated and guaranteed to be unique across all the GAP speakers. And GAP nodes have no configuration whatsoever. And the way it was implemented is uh, I built an implementation where the GAP protocol runs in a library inside the application. The design goals was um, for the protocol to allocate V4 and V6 group addresses, multicast group addresses. Uh, group addresses, um, we wanted the group addresses to be allocated so they wouldn't com um, collide in layer two IGMP or MLDB snooping switches. So we made sure that the 23, 23 bits were unique for IPv4 multicast. Um, it can work on a single subnet, of course, in a layer two network, or it can work over a layer three infrastructure, including overlays when multicast is it uh, where you need it. Um, and it can coexist with other group allocation protocols just because we're gonna go to IANA and allocate a, a gap allocation block. Um, and when multicast is not um, available, we're gonna use multicast overlays to realize multicast to the application. And that's kind of the center of this. So if we go back to the first slide, basically, um, this um, presentation is showing you about GAP, but of course, all the various RFCs that we've done in LISP. 8378 is the signal-free multicast, which is head-end replication, and then it uses all the other machinery that we've built over the years with LISP. Okay, uh, just a creep, uh, a, a, a quick, uh, re a quick tutorial on how it works. Multicast source and receiver nodes participate in the GAP protocol. There's an application specific group name that they all rendezvous on and that maps to a group address. And we basically take a hash of the group address and then it's advertised in a claim message to make sure that no other group name hashed to the same address. And when there is a collision, we resolve the collision um, um, according to the spec. It's, it's, as, it's as simple as that. So like I said, the way I implemented it, I did a Python implementation. I built a echo sender and echo receiver test app where it imported the um, GAP library. So we can send, the, the ES basically sends this message, message on the command line to the group name, to all the receivers that are listening to it. And we also built a GAP monitoring tool called GAPshark um, to listen to the messages for debugging and various other uh, ancillary um, uh, things. But what's important is that for this demonstration, we built this thing called GapChat. And it's just basically a text-based multicast applications that uses the group addresses that are allocated by the Gap protocol. So every each user brings up GapChat with this group name, and they can send and receive, and it's multicasted to everybody um, that's participating. And of course, the demo we're gonna do is gonna show you how GapChat works over the Lisp overlay. So we're using mechanisms from 8378, of course, and with the, all the devices are, have to go through NATs, and my lispers.net implementation implements what's reported in this uh, uh, draft, okay? Um, the way the demo's set up is we, on top we have two VMs that are in AWS, they're on a terrestrial link, and then um, we have Dan Mini, which is um, a Mac Mini that's sitting at Dan's house on a terrestrial link through a residential service. And then my MacBook, when it was at home, because it's sitting there now, but when it was at home, it was behind a Starlink interface. And so is Mike's Mac as well. Um, so we're gonna show that all five of those guys are gonna join the same group and, and chit chat back and forth using Gap Chat with the name Dino Group. Okay, now we're going to show you the demo. And we're going to do the switch. Thank you. 
I'd like to give you a demo of the GAP protocol over a LISP overlay. Uh, basically, we're going to show three technologies here. We're going to show uh, GAP, the group address allocation protocol that allocates group addresses to applications, multicast applications dynamically. We're going to provide a multicast service using the LISP overlay, and we're going to show that the LISP, parts of the LISP overlay can run over a satellite network. We're going to show five nodes in this demo. Uh, we're going to show Dino MacBook and Mike Mac uh, is going to be on the satellite link. We're going to have Dan Mini be on a residential um, terrestrial landline. And we're going to have two VMs in Amazon called XTR1 and XTR2 that are going to participate in the demo. So if we come over to these sets of windows, we have Dino MacBook here up in the left, upper left-hand corner. And we have um, um, Mike's MacBook here. These two are the satellite guys. And we have Dan's uh, Mini right here. Uh, they're already joined to the group by using GapChat. GapChat is basically a multicast application that uses the Gap API to allocate addresses. Uh, when you start the application with a, a group name, it will hash into a group address that's uh, being used. And we'll show you that in more detail in a second. Okay, so the idea here is uh, we have all three that are uh, part of the group that are already joined. And if we look at the RTR, uh, we see the map cache in the LISP RTR has the three members, Dino MacBook, Dan Winnie, and Mike, MacBook, uh, Mike MacBook. Um, It turns out that the, most, the group name Dino Group will hash into 224, 94, 0, 236. And all of these nodes are also running the GAP protocol that runs on this well-known group, 224, 0, 170, 170, okay? The idea of the application is that it just broadcasts or sends messages to one another over the multicast group. So if we send this hello, we see that the other two nodes got it. Uh, the EID for Dino MacBook is 241 It was sent to the 236 group, and we see that uh, Mike's MacBook uh, um, received it. So this was sent over the satellite network um, to the RTR that's deployed in Amazon, and it replicated it to it replicated the multicast packet to Mike over the satellite and to Dan. Uh, note that the group and the source are the same. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to join, we're going to have these other two guys join from um, XTR1 and XTR2, which are two VMs. So starting up the get chat group, we're going to um, start this guy up, and we're going to show that the join latency is, is pretty fast. So if we then again look at the RTR, uh, we will see that um, AXTR1 is now joined to the, um, to the group. So we have now four members that are running. And let's say he just sends, hello, I am AXTR1, just joining, and everybody should get that message. Okay. And we see that um, Dan got it. We see that Mike got it. And we see that Dino got it. Okay. Let's just join one more. Okay. And let's say, hello, just got here. I'm AXTR2. Two, and you can see that Dino got it, Mike got it, and um, Dan got it. And let's look at the other VM, and the other VM also got it. And if we just look at the state again in the RTR, we'll just see now that we have five group members, one, two, three, four, and five, okay? Now what we implemented was a uh, a ping protocol in the application. So if one of these guys sends a ping, it'll just show that everybody has, has received the ping. And then they're all going to reply to the ping with a Pong message. And the Pong message is going to be multicast back to the group. So let's try that from uh, Dino MacBook. Okay, so what happened here was uh, we did the ping and Dino MacBook sent the ping out um, to the 236 group it's associated with Dino dash group. And this was the sequence number for the ping. And what Dino got back was from 
a um, XTR2, the AWSVM, got a pong from it, got a pong from XTR1, got a pong from Mike, and one from Daniel. Now, since these pongs were um, multicasted, we see that all the other nodes um, have received the pong too and are displaying it. Okay. So basically, we're providing a multicast service here with the Lisp overlay. And um, that's allowing anybody to connect anywhere on the internet where they have connections to the internet underlay. And it could be satellite, it could be terrestrial, and they're all behind uh, NAT devices. So the NAT traversal logic is being used um, here as well. Thank you for watching. Question or comments? Hi, I'm Altanai from Cisco Meraki. I'm kind of new. I'm trying to understand the real life applications of this protocol and how we can avoid flooding, which could be a potential issue. Yeah, so if there was, if those five nodes, like say that the two VMs on top was gonna join some other group, um, they, they would only get, because of multi, we, the definition of IP multicast is whoever joins are the only ones who get it. Those two VMs would get messages just for that group and as well as the group, the Dino group that all five are doing it. So it's, it's not flooding it. It's if you explicitly request a multicast stream or piece of data, you'll get it. And when you're done, you leave and it gets pruned off the, the tree and the mapping system. If you're running native multicast, there's a multicast distribution tree that gets pruned, so packets don't have to go to that end. This is an overlay where there's a head end replication being sent to where it has to be. When those guys leave, I didn't show it in the demo, but if those guys leave, they're removed from the mapping system, so subsequent packets don't go to the guys who have left. Okay, can you uh, follow up question? Can you just repeat when it gets terminated, when the group ceases to exist, when the last person exists, or there's a timer at Oh, when one can reconnect. Yeah, yeah, great question. So if, um, can we go to the diagram? Just a couple slides. Oh, I can. <laughs> okay, so um, when, when these guys are running that gap chat application, once you exit the application, it causes an IGMP leave to be done. That message basically goes to the Lisp XTR that's co-located with the application that tells the mapping system to remove me from the mapping. As Soon as that happens, that node doesn't get data any longer. Okay. Got it. Okay. Is it? Any no other more question? No. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Alberto, you have five minutes on the young model. Um, yeah, this is Alberto Rodriguez Francisco. I don't have slides or anything. So this is just to um, comment on the email that uh, Matt sent to the list. Basically, as Luigi said, right, we asked for working group as call for Liz Young. Um, the doing has been stable for several years. We did um, a lot of back and forth when the main RFCs were being standardized and going to a standard stack. And it's aligned with the latest specs on the, on the RFCs 93XX, as I think I put it on the slide. Um, but Matt uh, raises a few points. I was asking him before if he would be around, but uh, he had some overlap, so he had to leave. Um, and I wanted to get the opinion of the working group. You can share it now or then go to the list. Two things. One is um, what he was um, suggesting in terms of having Ayana um, maintain the model for the uh, several identifiers that we use. That right now are discussed and described on the on the ITF on the on the list young document, and the other one and maybe this is for you, you know, on the um, geo coordinates. So it seems that there is some young specification for geo coordinates. Uh, I'm not very aware of how that works or if that applies. But Matt was asking if um, that's something that we can reuse geo uh, coordinates grouping. I think is the term. You can you can check the email on the list on what he was um, pointing to and see if that makes sense for the 
your coordinates that we use on Lisp. Yes, yes. So just to to raise awareness on those comments, if you have anything to say, just send a comment to the list, or otherwise we will you know, use our best judgment to address those comments. We, uh, uh, yes. Actually, I may propose to contact a young doctor. And okay, exactly. That was my <laughs> follow-up. Uh, if, if we can get I mean, help. We, we, we can contact one of one so to, to get help and, and refine the, the document. That's perfect. Yeah. Uh, and then we do the, the, the and last you, call on the mailing list. You take care of that, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if we can get the help from one year doctor to sure. look at this yeah. uh, small details. It makes sense to me. It would be fantastic. In terms of protocol specification, I think that we are good. But you know, young details beyond list details escape me. So it would be good to have so, help. That's what we can do. I contact a young doctor, <laughs> and then uh, we'll refine the document, and then we, we start the last that's, call on the mailing that's, list. That's good. Very good. Uh, All once right. we are done. OK. okay. And, and, and Dino is on you to comment on the your coordinates. <laughs> All right. All right. OK. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. A few, a few days ago, I just searched for Liz Young on the mailing list. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey everyone, so we're just going to present uh, what we discussed over in Japan about rechartering. So last time we went over all the documents and saw which ones that we want to retain and which ones we want to add or move to the standards. So what we're doing today is that we're going to actually show you the charter. So the first, the first slide we're going to go is pretty much the standard of explaining what the working group is about. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that slide, so I will let you actually review that when we send it on the working group alias. I'd like to keep um, a little bit more time about discussing the working group work items. And, um, and uh, I'll give you, so what we have added here was the net transversal, because there was a lot of interest on that. The young girl that you know, Abraha just discussed that uh, is very close to delivery, and the multicast support where there's three documents that we would like to merge. So, I'd like to hear a little bit from folks here whether they have any comments on this. Any objections on this? You guys are up to date on the idea of not the to I don't know if you're up to date with it, but I'm trying to record it. This is Dino. So the um, Lispers.net um, NAT traversal document was once a specification, but it was turned into a report of the implementation. Mm -hmm. So going back and forth with Elliot, the ISE, um, it was decided that we're not going to make it informational because his his board didn't like something about it. So, okay. Did you guys oh, know what, that? What, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. it, right, yes, exactly. It's nothing. Uh, okay. So, it, so, uh, so it's not it's not going to be published under any ITF content. Okay, but. Uh, we we also have the um, Dina's document. Yeah, the, uh, and that should be considered as a working group document, right? Exactly. Yeah. So a long time ago, we we committed to have an traversal solution, which makes sense, totally sense, to be honest. So the idea is to continue that work or restart that work on the base that we have. Um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly when to comment, so I will do it now. Uh, so if this is just the list of working group items for the proposed charter, or, yeah. yeah. Um, I discussed this briefly with, with Lujan in the corridor before, but something that is missing here is reliable transport. 
So something that needs to go into the new charter, and I'm making this comment for the group at large um, after the discussion with Luigi, right? Um, Reliable transfer is a document that has been sitting around for a long time, but it's one of the main documents that least production networks are relying on. So it has seen a lot of deployment and it's something that we need to, you know, finalize at the ITF. So that should be one of the top priorities for any new charter for Lisp, because, you know, people is depending on, on that to run their Lisp networks. Um, so yeah, I guess that it's fine to, to add it to the list. I guess, uh, as I told to you, it, it's not difficult to add text in, in, to, to, to accommodate the document if you say this is widely used uh, by, by your customers. Uh, so it makes sense to, to have it somehow. You have also to work on it and push it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We can... Yeah, I hope that the, um, the authors can make a push for it. And actually, that released one author and, and he left, <laughs> I guess. Um, but uh, uh, like people at Mark and, and Balaji and so on, uh, my understanding is that they are looking to work on that. And I don't want to speak for them, of course, right? So hopefully, yeah, we can get some progress done on that document. So I was going to say, let's look at all the items because that's just part of the items. That's just part one. So we have other items. So that's why I was asking if it is the right answer. time to, to do it or not. I was looking at you. So right. I just wanted to maybe let's let's maybe let's do this. Let's look at the two slides. This is the second part of all the documents, and I think that will address some of the concerns. Uh, um, so here we have all the standard track documents that we were actually on that we discussed last time that we were going to actually make them become st standard track um the next one is mobility where we have a lot of documents in mobility and actually um there is mobile list mobile node for example there's all these documents that have been you know kind of stalled a little bit and maybe actually move them and then Privacy and security, where we have the idea and anonymity, we have um, the, you know, different VPN segmentations. There's a lot of, I think we've got three, three drafts at least over there. And then the last one is the list applicability, where I think that will actually address some of those um, drafts talking about, you know, the customer, uh, how do we use Lisp and in what kind of, uh, maybe unusual scenarios that we didn't think of using less before, but actually interesting ones. So these are actually concludes with all the items. So I wanted to know whether, before we go into the milestones, uh, whether there is any objections on those or is there anything that's missing? We'll have more discussion on the working group list, but I just wanted to kind of poll here. Hi, um, I've already thought of each way. Uh, now that I read this again, um, I just have a question on the multicast on the last slide. Basically, you're saying the current experimental documents need to be merged and republished. Is there any new work on multicast or is the work just republishing into standard track? And the reason I ask that is that if that's the only work in multicast, then that's covered by this other bullet here of moving stuff towards the standard track. But, I mean, if there's more work, great. If not, you know, I'm just saying that that way the charter doesn't look uh, so big. This is, this is Dino. In terms of multicast work, there's no nothing new that was added to the protocols or architecture. All the documents are use cases. And, and yeah, I'm assuming, uh, and I don't remember the overall header, uh, but I'm assuming that there is going to be called out that lists that the working group is, is responsible for the maintenance of the protocol, et cetera. So if there's some new little thing that should happen that is not covered, you know, that should be okay. Um, so the only other comment that I have is, um, and you guys know from when I was the AD that um, I have some concern about the applicability documents. And the way I read this text it sounds as if there's going to be 
a document mm -hmm. that updates 7215. Not necessarily several documents that document how different LISP use cases may, may be implemented, yeah. uh, which I th think that's what I understood you said. Yeah. Um, so all, all I'm saying is clarify that, right? If you're gonna produce many documents, it's better to say upfront many documents than to later hit someone in the AAG that says, oh, that is not the charter or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you, want, you are suggesting to do more if that's the intent, yes, because that's that's what I read, or, or that's what I read here. If the intent is to, pro, pro, to potentially produce multiple documents on how do I use list here and list there and list somewhere else, um, then be specific about that. So, since you brought that up, Alvaro, you confuse. I got confused, and so now that question I have. Not, not from what you said, you just raised a point. Do you want to standardize 7215, which means it's the applicability of LISP at that time when it was published? Or do you want the latest applicability of LISP um, as of July, 2023? 7215 uh, uh, is basically deployment consideration. It's informational and, uh, and the document we produce will be again, informational, but is uh, on a use case that is pretty old, not not the main use case anymore of LISP. So it may, makes totally sense to up, 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 update with something that is recent and meaningful. Ah, this is Alberto Francisco. Just to be clear on this discussion, here are we talking about a document that contains the information on the like ground-based LISP and hexagon draft and so on, or are we talking about something different? To me, it could be uh, this as well. I mean, uh, because if, if we want to have a single document that covers those particular use cases plus additional ones, we are going to end up with a. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to document everything at the same time, or not all the use cases. Maybe the work group should decide a, a small set of needs. So if, if this is supposed to be a document that, you know, gives people ideas, different ideas on what they can do with LISP, that's fine. But for those particular use cases, and we have discussed this in the past, where other organization bodies, like uh, ICAO and the Automotive Association Consortium, may use the, you know, those particular details, um, I think that we should still have all the details for those use cases, right, in, in their own documents. Um, so, Jim Guichard, uh, Future Weight. Um, I'd, the LISP applicability, um, I'd want to clarify that one a bit as well, because I just looked at 7215 and it's an experimental ROC. So, I'm assuming that this point means that you want to officially standardize that ROC and then update it with new use cases. Is that correct? Because if it is, we need to make that clearer. That, yeah, that's my we, only we comment. Need to clarify that. One of the discussions that we were having earlier is that it is pretty obsolete from what it was supposed to be. So we should refresh it and actually do that. W one thing that I wanted to uh, respond to Alvaro, yes, we want one document, but I think that as we go along, most probably there's going to be supplemental document. I, I'm kind of, um, you know, um, not sure exactly right now. I don't have a real strong opinion about one way or the other, but I do think that maybe in the future there might be supplemental documents you know, over a couple of years or something like that. Okay. Uh, sorry, I know we're standing in front of Alvaro, uh, again. Uh, sure, so just clarify it. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm with Alberto here on, it would be nice to have a document that sort of gives ideas and, and talks about deployment models, scenarios, I don't know what it is, uh, versus having um, from the working group, a document that says, oh, this is how I use LISP 
on data centers and Lisp and satellites and Lisp and airplanes and Lisp and cars, um, which is all great that Lisp can be used in so many places, but mo most of these documents don't actually contribute or they, they don't, they, they contribute a lot. They don't change Lisp, right? They tell you how to use it. And okay, you have the XTR here and you have the guy, other guy there and you know, et cetera. Um, if that is what the working group is gonna work on, make sure you say that. So, Prakash uh, No, no, uh, let me just make a comment. No, no, share set on, but uh, I don't believe we need to have uh, several uh, documents because a lot of them will somehow overlap because the, the principle to, to, to use Lisp are the same. Then you have some declinations and some, some differences on this that are specific to the use case. But if we have several documents, they, they, this will overlap. So, and will not, it, the counter argument of having one document can grow huge. Well, you can have zillions of small documents which adds up uh, to the same thing. So to me, it's more important to have a, uh, let's choose the more, most important use cases and then define one document with the principle uh, a little bit, how Lisp can be deployed. It. And then in different sections, we can put the details of the specific use case. This is how I see this, this work item, but my personal opinion. Uh, this is Dino. Maybe I can make a suggestion to solve the the problem that you brought up, Luigi, and to address both Alvaro and, and Alberto. Why don't we make the applicability document say, uh, Lisp can do this. So it's what it can do. And then when you want to know how it does it, then you point to all the other documents. In other words, what, what Lisp can do was the list that he just uttered just, you know, this can work in data centers because it can do this. This can work in satellites because it can do this. How it does it, point to the existing documents. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a... <laughs> so, so we don't have a a multiple, basic, the uh, one problem in the document doesn't give... So we, we are not going to repeat all the... the, the, the yeah, well, I think if you do that, I think there's no overlap either. Right. Yeah. So the only, the only detail I want to point out is... Um, what is the status, or I want to ask, what is the status of those other documents? Are these other documents working group documents? We want to then call them out of the charter, or are they other documents okay, that, yes, splattered across both. that maybe can be published through the ISC or somewhere, right? Because we don't need working group consensus to, to reflect how an implementation was done for boats, right, or something. But what about like something like VPNs that's so fundamental? Uh, Correct. Maybe that, yes. Now, there's an item there for VPN somewhere. Um, the uh, other ones that are not so fundamental should go on to VPN. Correct. Because, I mean, we don't need working with consensus to agree that this can be used on um, books, right? Uh, but, I would like to caution about one thing, though. We don't want document for every single small use case because we're going to have a proliferation of documents. What I really think is that I don't know exactly you know, maybe we can come up with a wording which is better about, you know, the scope significantly changes or else it should refer to the, the major document. The main document should cover a number of cases and only the novel ones, which are pretty um, not covered in the document should be new documents. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're not pointing to all kinds of small use cases going there. Prakash and Cisco, I, I would like to say that uh, we're okay with if you want to update the 70 to 15 and whatever the uh, old use case with the new. However, on, on the uh, uh, point I were raised, I can tell you that we have almost more than 3,000 deployment today using uh, uh, using Lisp, and every day we are talking to the customer. There is a new use case is coming, so it won't be possible to update everything in one go. So I would agree that there, we should keep the charter open for possibility of adding the new uh, use cases or applicability. That's okay. I, actually, that's a good cue because I will show the tentative milestones on that document where it is, it's way down the road. So that will give us a long living document before it actually becomes a standard. So we'll, we'll go that next, but I would like to
Yeah. All I want is that we should yeah. keep it open to have the more and more applicability document because it will come yeah. based on our experience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Robert Rashud, um, completely different topic. As this is the proposed charter discussion, I have a question. So, so far, from what I understand, LISP uh, works on the underlay and it works pretty much on the best effort path from X, between XERs. Is there any way anyone here in this working group thought about making optimal routing LISP in, in the sense that you actually not go from the source to destination, but maybe hop for another transit TR just to get better performance of the data path? That's the lit, but that's, it's already covered? Yeah. Okay, then fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Sanjay Huda and coming back on the same topic. I think uh, from the learning from 3000 plus deployments, you found out that there are less than 10, actually the modules which actually plug all this in to make these <clears throat> multiple use cases. I think from that perspective, it's probably best to describe those 10 building blocks in the document. That way, as, as this document actually evolves, those 10 actually building blocks can be said, okay, like Lego blocks, we can basically fit in to basically set up the use cases. And I can actually, uh, I'll talk to Dino what those 10 building blocks are. <laughs> um, because those are very, very, I think, pretty unique. Some of the use cases, which you could not really uh, solve by any other method, actually list helped us. So and that's where it is. I think it should start from those five to 10 building blocks and it should go from. So Jim, just a couple of comments. Um, first comment is we spent most of the time with the charter discussion talking about list applicability, which worries me greatly because I don't want to see, you know, from a working group perspective, it's the other stuff that seems to be important to be focusing our time on. And the only thing with this is to allow us in the charter to have the flexibility to, to do this. So we just need to work on that word in a little bit, but um, yeah, that's kind of the comment. Jen, should you ask? Yeah. I'd, 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 this shouldn't be front and center of the charter, basically, is what I'm saying. I, I, I don't want the ISG to think, oh, LISP is just going to do all the bunch of applicability documents, and we, we need to make sure that's not what they're thinking. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So coming back, that's a great cue for the next slide, which is basically uh, looking at the monster. And um, as you will notice, the LISP applicability is kind of pretty further down the road that will give us a chance to actually accomplish the other drafts, which are higher priority uh, right now. So I'll let you read this and any comments. I may propose the following way forward. Uh, we work a little bit on the applicability bullet so that it's clear that we have to revise the text, okay? And then we share this on the mailing list, as should be anyway. And so you have time to read and, and also look if the milestones are reasonable in time, et cetera, and send all the feedback and we will adjust uh, accordingly. I mean, uh, to me, it's the more reasonable next step. This is Dina. So um, the order of this, you guys made a judgment on the priority. 
or just because of its completeness? Like why is it, list it's, NAT it's second? It's a little bit the, 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 the maturity of the existing document or what could be the documents and the priorities at the same time. Okay, I mean, right, uh, okay. This Alberto was about to comment on something very similar because um, there are few. So, for instance, merge LCAF bis item number seven. Is that assuming the current list of LCAFs or assuming the new ones are going to come? No, there are two documents on the LCAF basically, so we can uh, put them together and have one standard track. Because if that is the case, it's super straightforward, right? It should yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there are a few other things like. For instance, 6832 bis, I guess, is going to be easy as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm as long as it is in the charter somewhere, I'm fine with the order, I guess. But yeah, same question as Dino. Why, why this order and not uh, other? It's yeah, what okay. we, we found as a possible order, but okay. there are other suggestions that are... We be Just up. one comment, and Alvaro will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think from a, from a charter perspective, the, these are milestones that you want to achieve, but if you happen to achieve one before the other, before that date, it actually doesn't matter. So yeah, just it's the contrary usually. If we, if we are late, we should rediscuss yeah, actually with exactly. you to update the exactly. milestones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is Dino. So I have a question for November 2026. Um, could recharter also mean the working group closes and there's a LISP ops group that starts because it will solely be operational stuff that's done and then it'll be easier to reflect your comments that you had over the last year or so. Yeah, okay, yeah. so that Something could be one option. In, okay. in three years or close by. Uh, we, we are over time. <laughs> so. Last comment, if you wish, Alberto. Otherwise, okay, one, uh, one, see you in Prague, guys. Yeah, one, uh, one sentence. I think that the second item list not traversal is very optimistic. The, the date is... Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much for all, all the feedback. It's already good input, and we will work on it and, and share with all of you on the mailing list. Thank you very much. We will catch up.